So when, when are we supposed to do these self-assessments, right? Um, uh, continually is what our ethics code now says. Well, that's not necessarily a, a concrete um, number that we can work with sometimes. Continually to me says like all the time, which makes sense. Um, I want to highlight some specific situations that should trigger you doing a little self-assessment, okay? So some specific things that you should do, and we're gonna start today, we're gonna walk away today with a plan for these, but we'll get to that. You, you need to have a baseline. You need to see where you are right now, right? You came to this, so hopefully you're interested. Um, some of you are newly certified and some of you um, might have a pretty good read on your, um, therefore might have a pretty good read on your competence because you just passed a thing and there's a big long task list on what you're competent in, hopefully. Um, but uh, we, we need a baseline, you need to start. Um, so we're gonna do a couple of things today that will give you a starting point. You should do some sort of self-assessment. I like the broadhead one um, for taking on new clients, thinking about the specific client in the specific context and what they are um, looking for and what you currently have available. Yes or no, do a little self-assessment, see if this is within your competence or what you can do to resolve that. When you are using new interventions, so um, you might have read about something really cool. You might have gone to a workshop. Somebody might have mentioned this thing. It's great. Um, I'm going to use the example of acceptance and commitment therapy. There's a lot more information and motivational interviewing. Actually, let's just narrow it down. Motivational interviewing. Um, there's been a lot of topics lately that I've seen about motivational interviewing and using motivational interviewing when you're working with families to help them to make change with the learner that you are supporting, right? Um, because sometimes getting care, uh, parent and caregiver uh, buy-in on programs is challenging. So here's a suggestion, motivational interviewing. Okay, well, before I jump in and use motivational interviewing, I need to learn more about what that is. Having one talk that says motivational interviewing is great doesn't necessarily prepare me to use that. So if I want to use this new intervention, that would be a chance to um, you know, to to do a self assessment. Okay, how familiar am I with this? How much literature have I read? Um, do I know someone else who's doing this so I could seek out some consultation? Are there places to get like this very specific training? Um, yes, there was one. Actually, it was really great too, because um, that has come up just a lot in the last year, I think motivational interviewing, I've seen that and I've attended I don't know, three or four now talks that have mentioned it in some capacity. Um, so that's a new thing if you hadn't heard about it. Not that it's a new thing. It's a new thing for ABA to start to uh, use. <laughs> um, also, you might wanna do a little self-assessment when accepting new job duties. So, so far we've kind of been talking about um, competence in the role of I'm the behavior analyst who is taking on clients that I am working with, or I am taking on supervisees, trainees that I am training. Um, what about in our jobs, right? Um, when I started my agency, uh, there were definitely new job duties that I took on. <laughs> Paying employees, insurance billing. These are new aspects. Those were new job duties that I took on that I needed to make sure that I had the appropriate competence in those areas or seek out the appropriate uh, resources. So I hired out for an agency to do billing because I don't want to and it's not my area of expertise, right? I 
hired an accountant to help me with managing the taxes and the paying of the people, right? So you have to recognize where your limits are and when you need to outsource, when you need to refer out, when you need to get somebody else. Um, there might there are other things that came along with that that i got additional training so like the managing of employees was something i had had a little bit of experience with with managing smaller teams so what does that look like how can i expand upon that and that's where like the obm professional development opportunities came in um, when you start to supervise others or when you are considering taking on a new supervisee or trainee, um, do a self-assessment and see, is this something that I um, have the training, have the capacity? Um, through the CBAI field supervision program, we accept um, trainees across a it's getting broader, a broad and broader range of backgrounds. This cohort 10, actually, um, we have somebody from a medical field. We have people working with um, birth to three. Um, we have some school people. We have some people already in the field. We have had distant people working in um, uh, small remote villages. We, it, when we take those on, we have to consider, I have to consider, can I supervise this person? Can I provide them with the supervision for where they are practicing this skill set? Or do we need to help find a setting for them where I can supervise them, right? So there are some of those differences and, and you have to consider that. Sure, I can I, I can sign on at, off on hours, I can give group supervision, um, but if you are applying it with a population that I'm not familiar with, that is outside of my scope of competence, I'm probably not the best supervisor <laughs> for that, right? We probably need to pull in somebody else. We probably need to um, get some additional support there. Um, I think the relationship with the school district is a good example. There are school district BCBAs that do the on-site supervision because I am not a school district BCBA. I can talk about the general principles, but they are going to be um, better suited at the on-site observation and feedback side of things because they are more familiar with that setting and that population and that system. Um, also, amongst all these other things, let's say you do nothing new. All of these are like new things. You do nothing new. At the minimum, <laughs> every two years <laughs> when you have to recertify, you should probably do a little bit of a self-assessment when you are figuring out what CEUs do I need? What should I attend? What did I get most of this year, right? I know um, that, uh, you know, some people like to do their CEUs in bulk um, right before they have to renew, um, which is fine. It is a thing. <laughs> I see some disapproval, um, but uh, but then reflect upon that, right? Um, when what are you attending? If this is your all of your hours, <laughs> what are you allocating your time to, and what? are you gaining from that? Like I said, we can go and we can get hours, but if we're not learning, um, again, that's an opportunity for that self-assessment. Also, I don't um, encourage you to wait to the last minute because we all know that something could go wrong at the last minute and then, <laughs> and then you don't get to renew. And I've known people that have had challenges with their renewal because their CEUs didn't come in on time. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so when, so that's an idea on when. There are probably other ideas, um, but continually sounds so vague. I wanted to provide some really pinpointing 
circumstances. Um, this is kind of like uh, when I talk about to people about preference assessments. Well, how often should you be conducting preference assessments with your learners while you're working with them? It's like, well, like all the time, but like, what does that mean, right? Well, when they show disinterest, when they've completed an activity, when it's been, you know, a certain amount of time since they've last changed. So give you some pinpoints to think of.